Okay, well, welcome in participants. Uh, we are so excited to welcome you to the 23rd edition of the NIFA Food and Nutrition Security webinar series. My name is Suzanne Sluka, and I serve as the Deputy Director of the Institute of Food Safety and Nutrition and the NIFA Food and Nutrition Security Team Sponsor, and also the NIFA Food Loss and Waste Team Lead. Next slide, please. Before we start today, we wanted to elevate the importance of non-discrimination as we detail further here on the slide and at the link in the chat. Next slide. Also, we have just a few housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded. Please call the number here if you need Zoom support. Please use the Zoom question and answer box. We'll be monitoring that for questions. And we'll also use that to integrate questions in after the presentation. And in a few weeks, please check out our webinar series webpage that uh, is listed here today. We'll also put that in the chat for today's slides and the recording. Next slide, please. As you see here on the slide, today's webinar is part of NIFA's efforts to make progress on the departmental priorities listed here. And those are addressing, addressing climate change through climate smart agriculture, forestry, and clean energy, creating more and better market opportunities, tackling food and nutrition insecurity, and advancing racial justice, equity, opportunity, and rural prosperity. Next slide. Specific to tackling food and nutrition security, we've assembled a team of more than 80 NIFA staff who are working across the institutes and offices that you see here to use research, education, extension, and innovation to advance food and nutrition security. Next slide. Also illustrated here, are some relevant funding opportunities within our flagship Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, or AFRI for short, with our work that includes strengthening intersections between climate, food systems, and nutrition security. You can learn more about the breadth and depth of our efforts within AFRI and beyond at our topic page and prior, prior webinar, um, also listed at the bottom of this slide. Um, and as we talked about earlier uh, with this webinar highlighting our actions to reduce food loss and waste, we are just so excited um, to bring to you this series and the staff that support these efforts. So as you can see here listed on the slide is not only our NIFA food loss um, and waste collaborators that are across the agency, but we're also highlighting our full-time staff and our most newest, a recent addition to that team, the USDA Food Loss and Waste Liaison, Dr. Jean Busby. Uh, it's a farm bill position uh, that she holds, um, again, and she just recently transitioned uh, from the Office of the Chief Economist to NIFA, so excited to have her on board. And we have such a tremendous relationship with her, but also uh, with her management and program analyst, Sarah Belair. So Sarah is also joined NIFA as well. So again, thank you so much. We're excited to continue this work and to have you here at NIFA. And so now I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Busby uh, to get us started. Thank you so much, Suzanne. The next slide, please. I'd like to, to talk just a little bit more about my food loss and waste position. As Suzanne mentioned, this was a position created in the 2018 Farm Bill by Congress, and it is a position across uh, all USDA's uh, food loss and waste activities. And I, I work with uh, people within USDA and as well as people in other federal agencies or other government agencies, as well as external stakeholders. Uh, I take care of things such as technical assistance reports from Congress. Uh, in the Farm Bill, there were also two reports that were requested in that Farm Bill. Um, most recently, we, we renewed our federal interagency food loss and waste collaboration between USDA and FDA. And for, for the first time, we brought in the U.S. Agency for International Development uh, when we resigned that collaboration in late May. Another thing we did, next slide, uh, be is between EPA, USDA, and FDA, uh, we, we recently published uh, or worked on and developed a national strategy for reducing food loss and waste and recycling organics. Uh, Secretary Vilsack announced this report at the REFED Summit in Baltimore in June 
And this was actually a White House report with four main objectives, uh, preventing food loss and preventing food waste, recycling uh, organic waste, including uh, food scraps, and supporting policies that incentivize and encourage food loss and waste prevention and organics recycling. Before I go any further, I'd like to make the distinction between food loss and food waste. Uh, here, we're talking about food that is intended for human consumption, but leaves the food supply chain for any reason. Food loss is uh, that food that leaves the supply chain between production up until the retail loading dock in essence. And in essence, food waste occurs at retail stores, in food service outlets like restaurants and fast food chains and other kinds of cafeterias, as well as in consumers' homes. This is really a big, uh, you know, a big deal because it's charting the course for these agencies now into the, you know, future years. And so it's really exciting to have this uh, roadmap out. I encourage people to take a peek if they haven't had a chance to already. Uh, I counted that there were 18 USDA agencies and offices uh, that were involved in the USDA contributions to this report. So very exciting. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to that federal interagency food loss and waste collaboration, uh, we have other public-private partnerships as well. And, and there's, it is, uh, food loss and waste, by the way, is such an enormous challenge with one third of all food being produced going uneaten for various reasons. And there are different sustainable management pathways to, to deal with it. Of course, the very first thing you want to do is try and prevent the food loss and waste from happening in the first place. But public-private partnerships is one way that we can approach this problem. Uh, those uh, agencies involved in that federal collaboration, uh, we each do our own individual activities as well as joint activities. Uh, the U.S. Food Loss and Waste 2030 Champions is one example of a joint activity between USDA and EPA where we have businesses who have uh, voluntarily joined to and commit to reducing food loss and waste in their own U.S. operations in half by 2030, which, by the way, coincides with our national goal that EPA and USDA set in 2015. Uh, there is a milestone report that provides actions and impacts for these champions. Uh, we also recently in, renewed uh, in June our collaboration or a memorandum of understanding with the Food Waste Reduction Alliance, which essentially represents the three industry association uh, representing food manufacturers, retailers, and the food service. Uh, we are also in the process of renewing our, our memorandum of understanding with REFED. And again, in addition to EPA, USDA, and FDA, we'll be bringing in USAID into that agreement. Next slide. I just want to say that uh, from where I sit, there are four main buckets of activities that USDA uh, participates in. And again, uh, I work across all USDA agencies and offices. And uh, the first bucket is really research and research funding. Uh, we have uh, NIFA and ARS technological innovations are, are being, you know, there's research there as well as uh, in some cases help with the commercialization of these innovations. And they include new cultivars with longer shelf life, like such as a keepsake strawberry, uh, new machinery that has less bruising damage during harvest, for example, as well as a host of other uh, innovations where you can upcycle uh, food or uh, make other new and valuable products. USDA also provides regulatory guidance, such as to reduce consumer conf confusion about date labeling so that food isn't discarded prematurely. Uh, there's several different labels currently being used, like Best Buy, Use Buy, Sell Buy, and so forth. Uh, in addition, uh, we have the third bucket, which is our program funding, competitive proposals in many different ages. Uh, I do want to say that for the program funding, the USDA has so many different program opportunities, uh, and some of them have US or food loss and waste as a, a primary focus, uh, such as in the composting food waste reduction cooperative agreement. And in other cases, 
a USDA program will have a different priority, but also touches on food loss and waste. There could be food loss and waste proposals and awards uh, included. Uh, for example, the Farm to School program does fund some food loss and waste uh, proposals. The fourth bucket is really outreach, and I'd like to turn to the next slide. The outreach and engagement, is. Uh, there's many different things that we do beyond uh, webinars and so forth. We hosted two USDA food loss and waste in a vir virtual innovation fairs uh, during the pandemic. We produce educational materials, uh, some in Spanish, and I think there's one in Chinese as well. And we do uh, give presentations and, and other kinds of outreach at a wide range of conferences and events and tabling opportunities. Uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to, the, all of our slides will be shared with you uh, after, along with the recording after the event. I, and so on this slide, I just wanted to share some links to some of the key resources, including some recent press releases that announced different uh, new work, such as what we will be hearing about from Brian Rowe and Brenna Ellison later in this webinar. Uh, next slide. I also want to encourage people to sign up for our USDA Food Loss and Ways uh, newsletter. We also have a Food Loss and Ways website with plenty of materials uh, by different categories of uh, stakeholders, such as uh, consumers and businesses and farmers and so forth. So check it out. We also have a YouTube channel with many videos. Uh, but really, I am a resource for you. So feel free to reach out to me at any time. Uh, I'd like to now turn over uh, the, to Dr. VJ Nandala, who is going to go into more. Uh, he will be sharing uh, some of the NIFA programs touching on food loss and waste. All, all to you now, VJ. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. So my name is Vijay Nandula. I'm a national program leader at the Division of uh, Plant Protection in the Institute of Food Production and Sustainability at uh, NIFA. So the next few slides, I'm going to present some programs at NIFA that address various aspects of food loss and waste. And these are uh, managed by uh, many of my NIFA colleagues. So it's uh, essentially a, a teamwork. So the Center for Research Behavioral Economics and Extension on Food Loss and Waste Program under the AFRI program, it's A1741. This was established in fiscal year 23 under the AFRI Foundational and Applied Science RFA. The goals were to examine or support research and extension efforts that address two or more food loss and waste issues to develop a national extension food loss and waste strategy that is in alignment with other national food loss and waste strategies and extension frameworks. Engage with minority serving institutions and or historically underserved communities. Next slide, please. So under this program, the Center for Food Conservation and Waste Reduction uh, Award was made this has a project funding of $1.5 million and the period of performance is from 2024 to 2029. And this award was made to Purdue University and the PD is Dr. Brenna Ellison. The project goals were to use food literacy, environment and waste assessment to establish a baseline measure of food literacy and identify behavioral strategies to promote food conservation and reduce waste engage the next generation in food loss and waste reduction in developing a national extinction food loss and waste strategy aligned with extinction's national framework for health equity by centering on nutrition security and co-created citizen science. Address food literacy gaps and build conservation engagement to reduce household food waste and promote nutritional security, health equity, and resilience through an online resource hub and co-created promotional campaign. Assess the interrelationship between food 
conservation and waste, food and nutrition security, healthy food programs and practices, and environmental impacts. Next slide, please. Another uh, award is the Food Loss and Waste Consumer Education Campaign Pilot. This has a funding of $2.5 million for the period of performance from 2024 to 2027. And the awarded institution is the Ohio, Ohio State University and the project director is Dr. Brian Rowe. The project goals were to identify and refine educational messages and materials appropriate for a household food waste reduction campaign, conduct and assess pilot household food waste reduction campaigns in three cities in the US, anticipate challenges in a national household food waste reduction campaign would encounter during a national rollout. Project, project the food waste reduction potential and cost benefit ratio of different national strategies for a household food waste reduction campaign, develop an integrated extension education program based upon current best practices to implement effective consumer food waste prevention programs. You'll be hearing more in detail on these two projects in the later part of this presentation. Next slide, please. The Food and Agricultural Service Learning Program has a program area priority in inter intended to increase knowledge of agriculture and improve the nutritional health of children and to bring together stakeholders from the distinct parts of the food system to increase the capacity for food, garden, and nutrition education within host organizations or entities, such as school cafeterias and classrooms, while fostering higher levels of community engagement between farms and school systems. It also encourages projects that reduce food loss and waste. It has a total program funding of $1 million with individual award funding up to a maximum of $240,000 for two years. And the contact information is given here uh, for you to get more information. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. The FASLP and 4-H, increasing food production and combating food waste and loss through 4-H. This program has the expected outcomes of utilizing cooperative extension 4-H's significant reach and evidence-based programmatic experience. And this project expects to prevent food waste and loss in schools, increased waste reduction efforts in schools, reduce plate waste in school feeding programs and to increase capacity for food production and nutrition education and increase youth leadership skills on food loss and waste. The project funding is up to close to $10 million with a period of performance from 2023 to 26 and the organization is National Forage Council and the project director is Beth Bernstein. Next slide, please. The Economics, Markets, and Trade Program, the A1641, has a program area priority of supporting economic research related to agricultural market structure and performance, international trade and domestic markets, agricultural production and resource use, consumer behavior, nutrition and food retail, farm labor and immigration policy, agricultural policy design and impacts, and technology development and adoption. The total program funding has $10 million with individual award funding of $650,000 for three to five years and partnership awards up to $800,000. And the contact is Dr. Charlotte Tuttle at NIFA. Next slide, please. The AFRI Sustainable Agricultural Systems a9201 seeks applications that use transdisciplinary approaches to promote blending of science, technology, and societal considerations. Applications that use systems approaches that significantly improve the local and regional supply of climate smart food and other agricultural products while fostering 
economic revitalization. Fully and applications that fully integrate research extension and education activities. Applications must, must address one or more of the following broad topic areas, food and nutrition security, strengthening the bioeconomy and climate smart agriculture and forestry. Next slide, please. The Community Food Projects Competitive Grants Program includes planning projects with a maximum award of 35,000 up to 36 months with a one is to one match requirement. And it brings together stakeholders from distinct parts of the food system to foster understanding of their local food security trends and plan for long-term solutions to increase community food and nutrition security. The community food projects have a maximum award of $400,000 up to four years. And again, a one is to one match is required. These provide investment in new startup projects or to invest in completing project plans towards the improvement of community food and nutrition security in keeping with the primary goals of the program. The third is the training and technical assistance grant with a maximum award of 250,000 per year for four years. No match is required for this. And this provides several services to program applicants and awardees. Next slide, please. Another program, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, or SARE, has the goal to encourage research and outreach designed to increase knowledge concerning agricultural production systems that maintain and enhance the quality and productivity of the soil, conserve soil, water, energy, natural resources, and fish and, and, fish and wildlife habitat. Maintain and enhance the quality of surface and groundwater, protect the health and safety of persons involved in the food and farm system, promote the well-being of animals and increase employment opportunities in agriculture. This program is administered through four regional host institutions and also a national reporting coordination and communications office at the University of Maryland. Next slide, please. The SARE Food Loss and Waste Training and Technical Assistance Grants Program has a 10 million one-time funding opportunity. It is managed by the Southern SARE at the University of Georgia. The RFA was released in April 2024 with applications due in late June 2024. Proposals are currently being reviewed for each region. Two to four projects per region are to be selected in the next several months. The program purposes include increase the self-reliance of communities in providing for their own food needs, promote comprehensive responses to local food access, farm, and nutrition issues, identify strategies for reducing food loss and waste by identifying value-added production opportunities, meet specific state, local, or neighborhood food and agriculture needs for planning for long-term solutions, create innovative marketing activities that mutually benefit agricultural stakeholders and consumers. Describe how the research or training and technical assistance will lead to improved quality of life for producers, communities, and consumers. Next slide, please. This slide has some key links related to the SARE program. And the regional SARE websites are listed here as well as SARE projects database can be accessed at this link. Next slide, please. Now I'll hand it over to Dr. Brenna Ellison from Purdue University. Thank you. Thanks, Vijay. Um, hi, everyone. As Vijay said, I'm Brenna Ellison. I'm a professor at Purdue University. And today I'm excited to talk about our, our newest venture with support of USDA funding um, and really hoping to inter introduce our new Center for Food Conservation and Waste Reduction to you all in hopes that we can find opportunities to collaborate in the future. Um, next slide, please. 
So some goals are what I'm trying to accomplish in my short time here today. Just give you an overview of the center, um, our goals and objectives, our current activities. We've only you know been active for a few months, but kind of give you an up, up to date look at what we're doing and then kind of our, our future goals and aspirations with what we'd like to do over the next five years. Next slide. Uh, so as BJ presented some of our objectives already, I don't want to spend too much time uh, at least reading them in depth, but our goal in general is to help accelerate meeting the national food loss and waste reduction targets that Jean talked about earlier by engaging underrepresented young adults, the private and public sectors and households in improving nutrition security through household food waste reduction. And I think what you'll see when you look at our project team, I work with um, Dr. Melissa Flew Prescott and Dr. Karen Bird, um, who are dietitians by training. We want to look at the intersections of in improving nutrition security and reducing food waste and how, how can we make those things happen in tandem. And so to do that, um, again, we have four objectives. We want to do community food waste assessments. We know a lot of that's been done, um, but we're wanting to do flu assessments and really also consider what food literacy looks like, because that is an important um, component of helping households manage food waste is to understand their, their current levels of food literacy. Um, and so this is an assessment we've already been piloting in, in other work. And so um, it looks at household food management behaviors, food literacy, and then also includes a, a waste audit. Um, in objective two, this is really about engaging the next generation uh, to help us develop that national extension food loss and waste strategy. In objective three, this is where we're really hoping to build a really interactive online resource hub. Um, we'll talk about kind of where we're at with that so far, uh, but also a co-created promotional campaign. I would say overall, we're the center's approach is to be a kind of grassroots bottom up approach, working with households um, on food waste reduction and improving nutrition security. Uh, our grant is centered around citizen science. And so helping households actively be part of the solution um, and help them feel like they're co-creating uh, strategies and knowledge and, and things that are relevant and culturally appropriate to them. And then an objective for this is just where we're trying to look at these intersections and interrelationships between food conservation and waste, food nutrition, security, um, healthy food programs and environmental impacts. Next slide, please. Uh, here is a summary of at least our center's personnel currently. So I am serving as the director. Uh, Melissa Flew Prescott at Case Western Reserve is the center's co-director. Um, she is in the Department of Nutrition, which is housed in the School of Medicine uh, there in Cleveland. And then Karen Bird is our research administrator and outreach coordinator. So she, again, is also a registered dietitian by training, just like Melissa. Um, and she's housed here at Purdue in the Ag Econ Department. We also already have an advisory council established for the center. I won't go into detail and read every name here, uh, but we will talk about six communities that we're working with right now. So the advisory board intends to have at least one person from each community, as well as a student representative from each community, which we have down below as food equity specialists. So um, we're in process of identifying those. Uh, one thing to note about our advisory council, I would say it's, it's slanted heavily towards people with extension experience, uh, but we also have some industry connections as well. Um, so academic plus extension has, has definitely been kind of what we're working towards to make sure we're, we're again, staying relevant for households and can really build out that extension framework. So let's, let's talk about what our center is currently doing. So the first part is kind of that objective one. So we're looking at the flu assessment and this is where we're starting student engagement and community assessment. So in our work, we, uh, we proposed that we would do community assessments in six different locations in the U.S. Uh, so currently we are piloting our program in Champaign, Illinois, uh, but the other locations we have picked are Corvallis, Oregon, Cleveland, Ohio, Gainesville, Florida, uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma, and Baltimore, Maryland. We selected these locations to have some geographic diversity in terms of census region, uh, but also racial ethnic diversity in communities. So trying to make sure that 
Again, if we're trying to develop strategies to reduce household food loss and waste that are culturally appropriate, that indeed um, we're working in communities that are culturally diverse. Um, so these are the six communities we plan to work with. Uh, next slide. And so within each community where we're starting is um, ident identifying food equity specialists. So we have a program we're piloting it right now at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and we're proposing approximately an 18-month program. So this is a, a serious commitment that students are taking. Um, there's a two part, the first two parts are required and the third is optional, but we think this will, you know, really be the part that students are even more excited about. So we're optimistic that most students will, will carry on through the full 18 months, but we also have to be respectful of graduation timelines. Uh, so for this fall semester, we're currently on week three of a nine week online training and networking uh, kind of synchronous, synchronous course. We'll talk about topics in that course in just a moment. Um, and then in the spring, this is where the students will actually lead the community assessment of food waste. So we'll provide them with all of the training. We'll manage, you know, things like participant incentives and so on. But the students will actually work with community partners to recruit households to participate in this community waste assessment. And so students who complete these first two components, that's what they need to complete their food equity specialist certificate. And then in the following fall, uh, we will have an optional way that students can engage. So we kind of have two different paths for that. Um, first, we'll take what we learn from the, the student-led research project, and we'll actually have a specific community food equity summit in Champaign-Urbana, where we invite the research participants as well as students and community partners to come together and talk about issues surrounding um, food waste, nutrition security, and food equity in that specific community and work to have roundtables to talk about potential solutions and collaborations. And so students will be involved in, in planning that summit as well as um, moderating sessions, being active on the panels and so on. Uh, the second way that students can engage is we're actually in our budget, uh, we made plans for a mini grant program where the students who have put in the work then can actually apply for a mini grant to try to positively impact food waste reduction efforts or um, efforts to promote nutrition security and food and health equity in the Champaign-Urbana community. Um, so we're really excited to roll that out. And actually, again, this is a bit more of the citizen science, letting them kind of take control and trying to find ways that they think make sense for their community. Next slide, sorry. Um, and then, so as I mentioned, we're in our first, first cohort now. Uh, our target was eight to 12 students, but we um, had actually quite a bit of interest in the program. And so we have 15 students right now that are in the online coursework with us. So I wanted to provide a breakdown just kind of of what our, our initial cohort looks like. Um, so in terms of classification distribution, we are very much uh, slanted in the undergraduate space, but we do have one graduate student working with us. Um, thankfully, we do have a, a lot of underclassmen, so eight are underclassmen, um, and I know a few of the seniors have aspirations to stay on for grad school at U of I, so um, in terms of the 18-month timeline, we're optimistic that quite a large set of them will be able to stick around and be engaged, and even the ones that do graduate can still have uh, a place to be involved if, you know, it works out for them and their next steps past graduation. In terms of major, we do have uh, quite a bit in the area of food science and dietetics and nutrition. So we found a lot of students in these particular majors that were interested, uh, but we do have um, some other majors represented as well, as you can see. And then from a, a diversity perspective, we feel like we have a, a really diverse cohort with um, several different race and ethnicities represented. So uh, we're excited to see what this first cohort can do. Uh, so as I mentioned, we are in the middle of a tra training program. So we started this just in mid-September and we have our third session tonight. Here is kind of an outline of what, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so outside of an intro and a wrap up, the kind of panel of, or the set of topics that we're looking at, um, what is a sustainable food system? We're focusing on the U.S., but I think longer term, there's probably capacity to take a, a more global look at this. Um, 
Tonight, we're going to be talking about food security and social determinants of health. We'll also talk about nutrition disease and health disparities, food equity. We'll have a big week on food conservation and waste reduction. And then week seven and eight in the curriculum, this is where we're actually going to bring in community organizations in Champaign-Urbana to help students start connecting with organizations that might help them recruit households in the spring and try to establish some trust and awareness of one another uh, during that time. And then in week eight, we hope to have a panel of policy and industry organizations that are dedicated to promoting food waste reduction, as well as nutrition security and food equity. Um, so I'm sure some of you on, on the webinar would be great fit for this. So please feel free to reach out as um, we are still looking uh, for speakers. So each week we do try to bring in guest speakers. So it's not just um, the center personnel delivering all of these lectures as we're not experts in all of these things uh, individually. So um, we, we do have guest speakers coming in and try to have panels each week so they can hear perspectives from different fields of interest and, and things like that. Um, so again, once they're done in, in week nine, that's when we kind of do wrap up reflection and, and then we'll move on into the research project in the spring. Here's kind of our timeline for, for where things are at now. So um, in the spring, we will start the student-led research in Champaign-Urbana, uh, but we're also hoping to start a second cohort on the West Coast in Corvallis uh, with the online synchronous training. And so that will help us kind of roll out a little bit. As, as you can imagine, it's hard to get time zones and schedules to align for cohorts as large as uh, 15 students. So we're trying to stagger them a little. But our hope is uh, by fall 26 that we will have the food equity summits at all of the sites done. Um, and then once we have the, the six community assessments and food equity summits completed, we'd like to move into a more national food equity summit, which would be hosted online. Um, and we can have these larger roundtables and talk about larger efforts being made, um, you know, highlighting a lot of the work that we've already seen on this webinar. Um, and I know what Brian's doing as well. These would all be great things to have included in like national level food equity summits. Uh, other activity we're currently in the process of working on is developing our website and online, online resource hub. Uh, so right now we're curating existing resources that can be included in an online resource hub. USDA has a lot of great resources as does ReFed and, and NRDC and many other groups. So we're in the process of trying to pull those together and work on kind of an, you know, an intense kind of library and categorization system so we can make it user friendly where you can find what you need. Uh, but we want overall the website to be very household facing and attractive to just the average person. And so we are working with a third party now on how we can, you know, kind of optimize our design uh, we're also in the process of doing a social media listening um, research project to see how people are talking about food waste online and comparing what's said in the news versus what we hear average people, if you will, saying on, on social media. So we're hoping that will also inform our website design, search engine optimization, and so on. Um, additionally, I think in the longer term, once we start the um, community assessments. We want to work with households as well as our food equity specialists to co-create resources that feel accessible, relevant, and culturally appropriate. I'm not even sure a website is the only way, you know, that people want to consume information at this point when we're living on reels uh, for the most part. And so we want to work with households again to help them feel like this is, this is theirs and they have an ownership stake in it. And so co-creation is a really important component of all the work that we're doing at the center. So where, where are we trying to go? Uh, so I'll talk through some kind of future aspirational things that we're working on. Um, not aspirational, this one will, will happen. It's just not the first thing we're doing in six months. Uh, so we are working to develop a national extension food loss and waste strategy. Um, so this will be informed by our work with the food equity specialists and community-based assessments. Uh, we do want to engage the public for feedback in this process at the local and national food equity summits. And then we'll also be incorporating feedback from extension professionals via land-grant listening sessions. Um, Ultimately, we want to ensure that health equity and nutrition security are centered in Extension's approach to food loss and waste reduction. 
Um, so this is a really big effort. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders involved that we want to be hearing from. And so uh, in the longer term, be looking for communications from the center on ways to give feedback and how to be involved. Um, obviously, we'll be looking at the, the White House document that Jean showed and be thinking about that um, and how how that can fit into an extension framework. But we also, um, as part of the RFP, need this to align for the national extension strategy for health equity. So we'll be looking at how we can, can best align all of those together. So some longer term goals and aspirations, not necessarily written into our project, but ways that we want to keep kind of the longevity of the center past the five years of initial funding. Uh, so we do want to have a national citizen science project where households elect to track and include their, their food waste data and as well as their food literacy data into dashboards. Uh, so we know we'll have data from at least six communities, but we do want to find a way to get households to opt in, uh, which ties to the second box in the middle. One way we've kind of thought about doing this is working with youth organizations. So can we find a partner in Scouts or Girl Scouts or 4-H to develop some sort of badge or challenge to have more households tracking their food waste? We don't expect this to be, you know, an extensively long exercise, but um, it's hard for households to want to change something that they're not really aware of maybe the magnitude of the problem that they, they have in their own home. So really building that initial awareness and getting more people to pay attention to the issue we think is a really important first step to making progress on helping households do a better job with food resource management. And then another uh, project that we're really excited about and, and currently working on additional funding to, to test out is we wanna actually work with households to basically try their own tailored co-created intervention to help them reduce waste and improve nutrition security. Uh, we know that every household is different and there may be different things they need or would like that could actually help them reduce waste. And so it's hard when we deliver large scale interventions to have that tailoring and customization. And so um, again, as we're, we're thinking about co-creation and kind of a bottom up approach, um, we want to try some individual individualized interventions to see if that has any success. And with that, I think that's the end of my time. Um, I'm certainly look forward to questions and, and future contacts over email. And with that, I believe uh, Brian is next to talk about the new work that he's doing. Yeah, were we gonna take questions? Um as well between if there are I questions. I think it's at Brenna. the end. At the end, okay. Well, thank you so much, Brenna. <clears throat> um, I'm happy to talk about uh, the Food Loss and Waste Consumer Education Campaign Pilot on behalf of Sarah Elnicky at Rutgers, um, the co-PI on this project. Um, welcome all of you here and happy to share what's moving forward. <clears throat> um, we'll be working with um, two major lanes of activity as part of this um, grant. Uh, the first one is focused on evaluation. That's where um, Ohio State will take the lead on this. These activities are interactive with each other um, and, and integrated, but uh, we do have uh, nominative, nominal heads for each of these. And here we'll be focusing on um, taking existing household food waste reduction campaign materials, partnering with three different U.S. cities, and really uh, digging in and getting rigorous measurements and evaluation of how campaigns function on the ground within particular uh, cities and municipalities. Uh, in the other lane, we've got um, with Sarah and Sabrina at Rutgers leading this, really then trying to take uh, a body of knowledge that's both informing our interactions with those three cities, but then also leveraging knowledge that we create as we interact with those three cities um, and share that through an extensive extension network, um, particularly with the Extension Foundation, using that as a platform uh, for engaging nationally with those involved uh, with extension throughout the country. We'll make sure that we connect with other ongoing educational networks. EPA has a great peer network that they have. NRDC has worked widely with cities. Um, uh, RAP, the uh, UK and now US entity is also 
heavily involved in uh, consumer food waste education as well. We're having conversations with all those groups as well as with Brenna and her group as well to make sure that we are um, being additive in our activities. <clears throat> and then of course, the learnings from those pilot city efforts, we really wanna be able to take that knowledge and propagate that forward uh, to any other group in the country at the community level that might be interested in uh, up, uh, standing up their own food waste reduction campaigns in their communities. Next slide, please. The, um, the study design, when we go into a particular city, um, again, we're trying to keep a very high level of rigor here. So I'll go through several slides where I speak about our approach. Um, within each city, we're gonna use what's known as a difference and difference approach. And what this really requires is making sure that you've got high quality measurement, both before and after the implementation of uh, any food waste reduction campaign, and also the maintenance of a treatment and a control group. <clears throat> a lot of studies out there um, often get the before and after measure uh, done and done quite well, but um, oftentimes there's not a control group or um, maybe the control group is a bit problematic. And that's really important because there is so much seasonality and secular trends in the amount of food waste reduction. And you really need that control group to make sure that you're not ascribing either too much or too little uh, change in household food waste to the campaign itself. You know, if there were a, an overall downward trend in food waste uh, just going on nationally and you implemented the campaign without a control group, you might say, oh, all that effect of the secular trend is due to the campaign when really in fact, it's just a national trend that's happening. When we go into cities, we'll draw upon the waste hauling route as our unit of observation. And so we'll grab and work with cities to identify 80 waste hauling routes in their metropolitan area. <clears throat> and uh, within those, we'll then pair those up to make sure that we've got a, a treatment and a control uh, route that are paired and look a lot like each other in terms of all their uh, distinguishing factors, geography, uh, demographics, SES, um, anything else that might affect the level of uh, food waste we might find emerging from any of those households. And then as we think about our cities, which we should be announcing very soon, we're on the cusp of uh, getting a, um, a press release out for our first city and um, also have um, our second city pretty well pinned down. Um, we're trying to have um, a lot of variation there in terms of geography, uh, demographics, culture, and also with respect to the city's uh, past exposure to food waste programming. Be interesting to see some that have had past programming, those that are a bit naive or have not had the opportunity to previously engage in any food waste reduction programming. Next slide, please. As we sit down with cities, um, <clears throat> we will work with them um, to identify and, and execute um, campaign communications. So our task is not to create a new campaign. There's a, another call out right now, in fact, from EPA where they'll be uh, working on a national, uh, new national campaign materials uh, for the uh, successful um, recipient of that grant. But rather we'll be working with cities to choose from existing campaigns uh, that have been executed elsewhere and make sure that they are able to um, pick one that works for them, customize it as the need be, uh, for their particular setting and situation. And again, this will require deep input from participating cities. And in fact, part of uh, the grant structure here is that we do have a stipend for cities to offset what we imagine to be some additional staff time that might be um, taken up as they work deeply with us to make sure that um, uh, the campaigns are undertaken and evaluated with rigor. Uh, the communications uh, that will take place um, are a little bit limited in that we uh, fix focus on direct mail, uh, door knocking, and uh, email and text messages to people along those uh, uh, treatment and control uh, waste hauling routes um, as it is available per city. Some cities have uh, great individual communications with people on their routes, others not so much. Um, the one thing that this grant does limit us from is for kind of broad spectrum um, communications modalities. Because we are doing a treatment and a control group in each city, 
we want the campaign materials to only go to the treatment group. So, um, you know, a, um, a mass social media campaign or a, a TV or radio campaign would kind of indiscriminately go to both treatment and control groups. <clears throat> um, and so we'll focus on uh, targeted communications, which many communities typically do use anyway when they undertake food waste uh, reduction campaigns. And again, that will allow us to maintain separation between our treatment and control groups to make sure we're having a, um, a very rigorous evaluation of the marginal impact of those campaign materials and not confusing it with anything else like a, a seasonal or a long-term trend. Next slide, please. Our evaluation approaches uh, rely on high quality measurement, again, to make sure we're being rigorous here and really understanding the value and impact of campaigns. And again, this sets up so that when uh, future work uh, allows for a national campaign, we've got really strong uh, information to be able to motivate and uh, calibrate what we think might be happening with national campaigns. So what we plan to do is uh, measure several different ways. A key method will be auditing along each of those waste hauling routes, where we'll grab samples uh, from the trucks that pick up um, garbage from each of those routes, and then we'll physically audit those samples, looking at the percent of waste uh, that falls into the general food category, uh, several different subcategories, produce, meats, et cetera, <clears throat> as well as an inedible or a um, food scrap uh, um, category. And <clears throat> that really allows us to have a very firm physical measurement uh, that we feel comfortable with as being kind of a ground truthing. We'll also then go into each of those routes and um, implement self-report surveys. Uh, we'll have people um, incentivized to respond to surveys. Um, and we've got a lot of familiarity here at Ohio State and <clears throat> some of our collaborators in undertaking these surveys where we'll have them self-assess their food waste over the course of a week. Um, and that survey will also then allow us to gauge campaign awareness. Were they getting the materials? Were they responding to those materials? Um, also, if those materials um, kind of motivated them to do composting, which wouldn't show up <clears throat> in um, uh, a garbage truck uh, uh, collection, we want to be able to measure those self-reported composting activities as well. <clears throat> and finally, we'll work with the city um, to see if there are and then measure any third-party composting activity. So if there are drop-off sites for composting in a particular city or private haulers, we'll do our best to make sure that we're measuring any changes in composting activity that might also occur with uh, those campaigns. Um, while cities will have some latitude uh, to choose different campaigns, we're expecting those campaigns to focus on food waste reduction, but we know that some of those campaigns also might encourage either directly or incidentally people to compost more. <clears throat> and we definitely want, uh, while reduction is always preferred, Increased composting is also a, a desirable outcome, and we want to make sure to try to measure that as closely as possible. And then for those measurements, we'll make sure to do a baseline before any of those campaigns uh, occur. And then um, about a month or two post, again, working with the city to make sure it works within their time frame and schedule. <clears throat> and then a medium term, a six to eight month uh, time lag after those campaigns to do a, a second round of measurement again, along all of these different modalities. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and so as we meet with cities, we kind of give them this very detailed uh, layout. It's about a year, a little over a year process working with any particular city <clears throat> where we've got um, a very intensive period at the beginning where we sit down and really operationalize <clears throat> what the the print of the, the footprint of this is going to be uh, within those cities, pick out the routes, pick out the campaign materials, start the logistics <clears throat> being organized. And then they'll basically hand the activity back over to us for the most part <clears throat> in terms of then implementing the campaigns um, and undertaking um, along with our um, <clears throat> uh, contractor, the physical measurement, and then the survey measurements as well at various time points. And we'll share any obvious uh, things along the way with the city, but then as data analysis is enabled as the, um, the post uh, campaign data collections ramp up, then we'll evaluate and make sure to 
share back the very pointed messages with the city and then the general things to be learned with um, our folks who are leading up our uh, education and uh, outreach group at Rutgers as well. Go on to the next slide. <clears throat> and then that brings us to our um, community of practice, which is being led by uh, Rutgers. <clears throat> and here, uh, uh, Sarah and Sabrina are leading up the effort to um, work through the Extension Foundation's Extension Forum to develop a, a community of practice <clears throat> where the target audiences here will be extension personnel uh, from throughout the United States, uh, plus local and state agency staffs. We can also imagine uh, this might be attractive to uh, other NGOs operating in this space. In year one, we'll focus on monthly webinars to highlight food waste reduction initiatives being implemented, um, <clears throat> particularly from an extension point of view. And so um, we've got plans for some different groups to present on this throughout the first year. Also, turn to industry when available to provide their takes on how they're thinking about implementing food waste reduction. Been in some conversation with Hellman's and Unilever on their group. <clears throat> and uh, Zach, I think I saw you somewhere on here as well. We might turn to you guys at um, Too Good to Go to see if you might be interested in, in <clears throat> being part of the seminar webinar series at some point as well. What we really, really want to create here is a community of practice, which would be a hub for professionals to collaborate share and learn from each other. <clears throat> As part of all this, we want to create an authoritative repository of resources for public use, particularly at the community <clears throat> and metropolitan level. A continuously update group on current uh, events and emerging topics, <clears throat> and making sure that we're being additive with EPA and other organizations who are um, have very similar or overlapping types of communities that they are supporting as well. And then as the um, year goes on, what we really hope might happen is that we can then form and facilitate smaller focused cohorts that are facing common challenges or programmatic interests. For example, perhaps there's a handful of cities who are all thinking about taking the plunge and putting in place their own um, <clears throat> reduction campaign. Um, that would be an excellent opportunity to have a cohort that we can uh, provide the facilitation to, or perhaps SNAP educators may be wanting to uh, develop a group of champions. Perhaps uh, maybe they would get certified as part of Brenna's group <clears throat> and are thinking about how to then execute programming. And that might be a, a collaborative opportunity between um, Brenna's center and our community of practice to develop something along those lines. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and our first event will be later this month and we welcome all of you to join that. Uh, the first will be a basically a kickoff seminar with uh, Sarah and myself talking a lot about some of these activities uh, as well. Into November, we'll bring in other experts from around the country, from the University of Rhode Island and um, University of California's uh, Natural Resources Group. And then we'll bring in experts from the Harvard Law School and the Share My Meals Group uh, in December there, right before the holidays. But uh, linkages are here. Feel free to join the community of practice, uh, register for that, register for the next webinar. We uh, welcome all to join that and hopefully we can develop a strong, robust community, which is then really going to be a strong backbone for when, if and when national uh, food waste reduction campaigns emerge from um, other activities going on here uh, at the federal level. Well, thanks for listening and uh, open up to questions, hand it back to the, the NIFA staff. Thank you so much. Um, it was just such a pleasure hearing from you, uh, Dr. Allison and Dr. Rowe. I know we've been um, really anticipating what these projects are gonna bring. Um, and so we thank you so much for sharing, sharing that overview. So I will just ask for Taylor to stop sharing the slides so we can go into gallery mode and see and bring others on um, to help answer the questions that you've been posing in the Q&A. But while we get others you know, starting to come back on camera, what I really wanna do is start to kick off with one quick question here for all panelists um, and ask you about 
again, what is it that you're you're looking forward to? You know, we, we've talked a lot about growing and expanding this work in reducing food loss and waste. So again, what what is really exciting to you um, in, in this space um, that you'd like to share with others? I, I think one thing that is really exciting to me is just the momentum I'm seeing. I've been in this space since I co-authored a 2002 report to Congress on plate, wa plate waste in school lunches. And I am seeing just a real momentum, both domestically and internationally in the awareness about food loss and waste and how it intersects with other parts of society and, and uh, you know other things like sustainability, the environment, climate change, addressing food and nutrition insecurity, and so many things. I just, I'm really heartened by the momentum that I'm seeing. Thanks, Jean. I think for me, um, I'm excited to try this co-creation. I feel like a lot of times we kind of talk at households and sometimes like they don't think that we know what we're talking about, right? And so I think kind of a fun opportunity to actually get to work with them directly and help them feel like they actually have agency in this process and in making a difference. And so I think that's what we're excited about. I think uh, with all these efforts, food loss and waste is going to catch on across all sectors of society just like climate change, invasive species, and other burning issues. I think it's going to become a national uh, issue. I'll jump in, yeah. Um, <clears throat> many, uh, probably some of you were at ReFed this summer <clears throat> uh, in Baltimore at their um, uh, Solution Summit. And uh, Dana Gunders made this very interesting parallel to um, um, kind of energy conservation <clears throat> and how uh, there are many efforts to kind of really bend that curve. And it took some while, it took some while, and then it really took off. And I think we might be at that point where um, there are enough investments, there are enough people thinking about this. It's becoming uh, more and more aware of this. Uh, some of the market uh, pressures are in place with high food prices and people very concerned about high food prices and thinking about ways to save on that, um, <clears throat> that we might be coming up to an inflection point. And um, I think that's why it's very exciting to have this investment <clears throat> from NIFA, see the investment coming from the private sector as well into platforms and ideas that can then interact with the investments at the federal level and the, in the public sphere. So I just really feel like we can be on the cusp of this and um, just to continue to press forward and, and prove the knowledge, keep finding those points where um, these low hanging fruit can be recovered and uh, shared. And I just want to add, can you hear me all right? Yes. All of the above, that is exciting to me. And also exciting for us here at NIFA and for me is to see the number of proposals that come through when we have a request for applications. And that really communicates to us that people are listening and people need, need solutions to this issue. And that to me is exciting. We just need to continue moving forward, see, see all these projects come together, but also like figure out how to um, provide more um, opportunities for these solutions in our communities. So it's very exciting, thank you. Charlotte, okay, are you good? Oh, I just don't wanna miss anybody. Yeah, I just wanna say, I mean, think back if you were around long enough about the beginnings of recycling when it was like five cents per bottle returned in and it had to start somewhere. And the same for food loss and waste. We'd like to eventually have it part of our everyday habits as far as uh, considering what you throw out. And there, you know, we can we can really spread the word on tips for consumers to, you know, what to do with leftovers and to freeze what you can't eat in the next two or three days and so forth. There's a lot of information. And I do want to emphasize, because uh, I saw one question. Uh, in the in the Q&A. And by the way, please feel free to add more questions there. We'll address all that we can. But I do want to emphasize that 
food loss and waste, of course, happens from farm to fork and there's solutions uh, and, and activities happening from farm to fork. And that's true also for USDA. We do have programs at the farm level. We do have programs with different sectors. Uh, at the farm level, for example, we have the community food projects that VJ mentioned and the TFAP Farm to Food Bank uh, program as well. And then with the EPA, as I mentioned, we have a 2030 Champions program where we have those businesses participating. And some of those are food manufacturers, some are retailers, some are food service. I mean, this is really uh, a kind of issue where everyone has a role to play in reducing food loss and waste. At the minimum, we're all consumers, uh, but then there's so much more that can be done. And we're trying to have a really broad view and tackle it at all stages. Back to you, Suzanne. Well, I think that was a great segue. Um, Miss Olivia has a couple questions in the Q&A for us. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able, if we have the expertise on to answer, we'll try. If not, we can certainly um, get back to you as well. I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but you're looking for, or potentially throwing out some ideas about, have we thought about uh, grain germ or bran? Um, you know, are they involved in food loss and waste in that whole dis food and distribution um, system? And then also, um, are we considering local milling um, also in food loss and food waste avoidance strategies? So anybody that wants to try to help tackle these two questions. Uh, I think in the biggest picture, I mean, that is a super, super technical question. In, in the largest scale, we're really trying to focus on food that is intended for consumption including the parts. Uh, I'll put a, a side comment as far as USDA's economic research service, where they estimated uh, food loss and waste at the retail and consumer levels. Uh, they went for the, using the data that was available, the inedible share was taken out there for grains. They focused on things like white and whole wheat flour. So it was already at that point. But in general, you know, if there is edible food uh, that's wholesome, we want to get it to those in need. If there's oper and I think another point I'd like to really make is that food loss and waste represents an opportunity for businesses to make or save money, as well as consumers to keep money in their pocket. But as far as businesses, if there's there could be opportunities to use uh, food uh, by you know byproducts from processing to make new and valuable. Uh, you know, uh, other foods or other kinds of products that that uh, can be sold and marketed successfully. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bro, can I just have you elaborate a little bit more? I know you typed in an answer for Naomi's question, sure. um, and then maybe others can join in as well. But again, all of you, why focus on the household population um, mm -hmm. instead of like they mentioned grocery stores or or those larger populations? Yeah, no, thanks. I can, I'm happy to elaborate. Um, yeah, I've been th thinking about this space, not quite as long as Gene, but getting close now in terms of thinking about food waste. And um, kind of philosophically, we think about the food uh, supply chain, the food system. <clears throat> um, if we don't right size the purpose of the food system, which is to feed humans, <clears throat> if we don't right size that demand, then the rest of the food supply chain <clears throat> will never really adjust. So <clears throat> getting and taming what we might call excess demand at the food, at the household level for food because of waste, if we can tame that, <clears throat> bring it down, it then really sends a signal to the rest of the food system. And then that signal can transmit back to get the right amount that is planted and hence the right amount of land that is used for agriculture. <clears throat> and that can really have some huge sustainability and uh, national resource implications, right? If we're no longer needing land that is might might be marginal, either here or abroad, <clears throat> um, that is often land that can also be used for conservation as well. And so um, that, uh, to me, is really a, a big issue. The other issue that I put into the, um, the, the answer is <clears throat> that every other portion of the food supply chain, you know, there is typically competition. <clears throat> there are firms that are competing against each other. And when there is waste, that is them being less competitive and more likely to being forced out of the supply chain just because they're not as competitive as somebody else. 
households, there isn't that competition, right? Some households are very financially focused and need to really think about that and try to pinch every penny because they really have to, or it's their nature. Others, not so. So at the household level, we just don't have a uniform signal <clears throat> about um, the financial penalty of waste being fundamentally important. For some, obviously it is, others it's not, it's not consistently there. And so things such as just reminding people and changing simple habits so that they can enjoy uh, those financial benefits of reducing less waste, I think is a really big public service uh, to those households as well. Every household would enjoy getting 500 or $1,000 more per year from savings, uh, from reducing food waste uh, as well. So yeah, that, that's kind of my, I'll get off my soapbox now about why households are so important to me in terms of uh, prioritizing in food waste. How about with all of your studies, you know, is there, I was just thinking about like Halloween coming up or holidays, you know, how, how will you account for, I'm assuming some of these, you know, there's, there's greater periods um, during some of these gatherings and stuff. How all have you considered incorporating that or looking at that in your projects and, and studies? I'll, I'll just note that we have always wanted to do a holiday study, but just because they are so rare. We typically do our measurements on non-holiday weeks just so that we're getting kind of the a normal week. Um, but I, I think it would be fascinating to do more specific work. And this is where I love Brenna to chime in because I know she's talked to groups of people who consider themselves kind of ultimate food conservers. And um, I bet they've got some great tricks and tips around the holidays uh, that can be particularly effective for those kind of high stakes weeks. Yeah, so I think that's something, you know, that's a fun way I think we want to engage households is, you know, can we even make challenges like like video challenges, like submit your coolest hack for what you do with leftover turkey or something like that. And so I think that's a way where we can kind of engage people in a new way or, you know, even in your own community. So we have these six communities. We're hoping to have kind of challenges within communities like can you boost your own community influence or and things like that and so I don't know that I have all the answers for the best things to do with the leftovers but I think that's something where households can actually share their creativity and, and make it fun and I know Jean's also writes good blogs on what to do with your leftovers. <laughs> Thanks uh, one one thing you can do with leftover pumpkins uh, is to put them out for for wildlife some communities have a pumpkin smash after Halloween and uh, they get together and it's part of a community gathering and it, you can deal with the excess pumpkins. But uh, yeah, so there are lots of tips for consumers on, on how to deal with leftovers and to reduce food loss and waste and keep the money in their pocket available on our USDA food loss and waste website. So just search for USDA food loss and waste web, you know, and you will find our website. NIFA also has a great uh, food loss and waste website as well. Well, and Nina posted in the chat, um, she also brought up, you know, natural disasters. And so any additional um, insight there or work um, that maybe, you know, uh, agencies are doing or others are doing, um, I think that's a that's a great comment, the, you know, imagining the food loss and waste coming out of this recent hurricane. So any thoughts there from our panelists? I've, one, one is, thought is more of an opportunity. I've heard that there's some promise in some apps about connecting uh, during a, an emergency like that, connecting people to where they can find food in, in some cases. So I think that's an, ex, uh, an opportunity that we could explore further. Yeah, I think there's two, two lanes there. One, people who are displaced, right? If you are running from the floods, it is hard to get anything into the canoe or the SUV that is taking you away through high waters other than yourself and your life. Uh, so that's just going to be, you know, hard to, to capture that. But for extended power outages in place, obviously, then I think there's probably some clever tricks and tips and sharing that might be able to be facilitated, right? Um, I haven't seen a lot of, a lot of research in that area. Um, I know there's humanitarian relief efforts and there's a lot of effort on supply chains during distressful periods and i'm sure people who can make more from their existing stocks 
take less, take a lot of pressure off of those supply chains. So I think there would be some interesting research there to see if the complementarity of uh, of those efforts to make sure that um, those two systems are talking to each other. But I haven't seen a lot of uh, scholarship on that. Maybe others have. Great. Um, well, you've talked, uh, Dr. Ellison, I mean, I guess this one's a little bit more for you. I was really excited about the youth voice piece here, you know, at USDA and NIFA, you know, having, you know, the 4-H program and we've got other projects working with 4-H council. So what are you hearing so far? I know you're just, you're just getting started. Um, but maybe again, what excites you in that area, what you're hearing, um, where others can get involved with that piece as well. Yeah, so really our, our engagement so far has been with our, our first cohort, but I would say they just think so differently than I think maybe I did when I was that age, right? They're just so excited and they already think so much more broadly that I think it took me like a whole professional career to be like, oh my goodness, like think about all these interconnections and it's like, it just kind of already clicks and they want to fix it. And so, um, you know, even younger, like even my own kid, it's funny. I have a five-year-old. He's already like telling his little brother, you can't waste your food. Like, do you know what mom does? Right. Like, so, you know, and anyways, we're, we're working on it. Uh, we haven't really got to connect with the youth organizations yet. That is on our long-term goal, but again, we're, we're trying to start with these cohorts and build excitement among them and hope to help them start to become influencers in their own community to help work with households. But I do think there's a lot of enthusiasm. Um, Melissa and I have done work in school settings too. So we have, you know, NIFA support to do work in school settings where we're trying to promote nutrition and reduce simul reduce waste simultaneously. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm in that space. No one wants waste to happen, uh, but we do hope maybe we can change how we talk about it, right? Brian mentioned these like conservers. And I think part of the behavioral economics is like, can we change the mindset? If no one wants to admit they waste food, like maybe we need to talk about it a little bit differently. So maybe we can become food conservers instead of people that don't want to admit we waste food. And so I think longer term behaviorally, we kind of want to adjust how people talk about it, because if it's something you're not willing to admit to, it's just really hard to do anything about it. Excellent, excellent points. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, I do, I do oh. want to, I'm sorry, Suzanne, I just really want to emphasize, you know, the importance of really trying to prevent food loss and waste from happening in the first place, with the very last resort ending up in a landfill, where all those embedded resources to produce that food, the arable land, fresh water, energy, and other inputs, uh, all go to waste as well. And also, if it's in a landfill, that's where it produces proportionally more methane than if you compost it, for example, because it de decomposes without oxygen in a landfill, so. Yeah, excellent points to elevate as well. Thanks, Jean. Um, okay, we've got some more questions flowing. Good job in keeping um, the curiosity. So Bruce, I do wanna, I'm gonna kind of again, uh, take your question and, and um, shorten it a little bit, but provide you an answer. So um, it sounds like you're looking for some avenues to promote maybe your small business. So um, we are more than happy. There's just a few programs that we hit on here at NIFA, but we are more than happy to visit with you. Um, reach out to any of our staff that you see here today and we'll line that up. But primarily what I'm thinking is our small business uh, program. And um, especially in our food and nutrition area that's led by Dr. Jody Williams, we will certainly connect you with her, but that's really what comes to mind. And if you've not been introduced that, to that opportunity, um, let's talk, let's visit, but we're also happy to lift up other um, as well. So again, re I don't think we have your email right now. So um, again, we put some in the chat, Sh Sheila has as well. So happy to visit with you, please. And then uh, Mr. Wenzel, Brick Wenzel, um, has a question. Why has Department of Commerce been left out from interagency work? Um, and he's talking about coastal sea, uh, seafood, United Nations and seafood. So maybe Jean, uh, maybe the national sure. strategy, can you help? Okay. Well, sure. I mean, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have the federal uh, 
interagency collaboration with, originally it was EPA, USDA, and FDA, uh, three main food and, and environment agencies. And then we brought in USAID. Uh, we're open to having other, other federal agencies involved in this collaboration. It's a matter of, you know, we've got so much to do and we've got uh, just a few staff and so forth. So uh, there's so much that could be done. You're right. It's not just Department of Commerce. It's uh, CDC, for example, has, the, you know, their role to play in the food service uh, operators guidelines and so forth and Department of Education. There's so many different federal agencies uh, that could be brought in if, uh, you know, if it works out well, then it's of the interest of both age, all the agencies. So I'm open to it. So, you know, no federal agency per, that wants to be part of the collaboration, have them reach out to me. Anybody else want to add to that? Okay. Thank, thank you again for posing that question. Okay, I'm just double checking the questions that we have here. I think we... There was one earlier, again, Jean, maybe I'll have you start on, and I just want to make sure Sarah did a nice job of, but it was on, how do you connect with 2023 or 2030 champions? You want to provide any more insight to the group here about future opportunities, um, how to connect on that? Well, yes, on our, first of all, on our USDA Food Loss and website, we have a whole page on uh, the, the 2030 champions. And again, this is a joint pledge with EPA. They also have a, a page with information. Uh, essentially, if there is a business that wants to join the 2030 champions, there is a, a simple form that can be filled out and submitted. We there The only uh, hot, you know, hurdle really is that the company has to publicly commit to reducing food loss and waste in their own US operations. That is the bar. Uh, some of these businesses are international in scope, but uh, that's the bar as it currently stands for the champions. And uh, we, we welcome and we are actively growing the program at the ReFed Summit. We hosted an in-person gathering of the 2030 champions and uh, you know, the way I look at these champions is that they are, they're business leaders, and I'm hoping that they will inspire other U.S. Uh, businesses to take action as well. Again, check out the milestone report that we have posted uh, on that champions page, because for many of these champions, uh, they have outlined what the activities are that they are doing, as well as the impact that they are seeing. And so if you skim through that milestone report and you are a business considering becoming a champion, check out what they've, what they've done. Are you doing similar things? And uh, then let us know, submit a form to USDA and EPA and we'd be delighted to consider it. Thank you. Dr. Rowe, I know you are typing and answering uh, Annie's question. I'm actually going to take that one too here to the floor because I'm going to turn it in a little space for all of you to share too. So um, this end of Annie's looking for advice. She wants to maybe career pivot into food rescue, food waste. So any advice others have for Annie um, on this panel, but I think people just to get to know you a little bit better, what, how did you all get interested in this space and, and arrive in, in, in working in this space as well. So um, whoever wants to start. I, I uh, was originally in the USDA Economic Research Service as an agriculture economist and um, inherited this database that was an opportunity to really dig into, you know, food loss and waste. And way back then, I mean, I really believe that someday food loss and waste was going to take off like recycling did. I, it's just one of those issues that crosses so many parts of society. The need is so great. You think of the, the food insecurity, both domestically and globally, and that we have finite amount of land and other resources, and it is a bipartisan issue. It's really just... It, it's something that just makes sense. It's something we need to lean into with a growing world population. Dr. Ellison, I don't mean to pry, but- No, no, that's okay, sure. <laughs> um, so I think 
I mean, ultimately, like I've kind of worked in different parts of the, the food industry. I've worked at, you know, in food service and grocery stores. And I think you see it over time. Uh, but I also did a lot of research in dining halls. And I think, you know, as a student, when you go through a college dining hall experience, you just see it. And it's kind of insane, like the amount of food that you might see. And so um, early on in my career, I spent a lot of time on what people like how they decide what to eat. And then I feel like I just kind of had a pivot once you started seeing more attention to it. And so now it's kind of like, why, why you choose what not to eat, right? And so um, I think calls for a zero waste are great. And I think, but from a consumer perspective, it's also like, but I don't want to get sick, right? And so like, how can we help people right? How can we help them avoid having to be in that situation in the first place? But I will say college dining halls were definitely an impetus into wanting to study this problem. Anything more to add, Dr. Rowe? Yeah. Yeah. And um, no, you have to recognize Jean as being a pioneer in, in this field. Her, we've <clears throat> She's publishing this stuff decades before any of the rest of us were thinking about that. But uh, the three of us, uh, Gene and uh, Brennan and I, are all trained as economists, and you know, waste is kind of anathema to economists. You know, it's something that we uh, find just inherently problematic as as economists. So, and then food is uh, is also very near and dear to a lot of our hearts, right? And so, when you try to solve food waste, you get a threefold benefit from doing that, right? You can address issues of food security. You can address issues <clears throat> of um, uh, financial waste and efficiency, and you can address issues of environmental and resource burden. And so it just makes a lot of sense uh, to do this. And when I got into the space, um, it was a lot largely dominated, I think, by more nutritionists and engineers. And the other thing economists love to do is think about trade-offs. And so, um, and there are lots of people saying we should have zero waste, which is a great concept in general, but economists also know that perfection is also very costly and difficult to achieve. And so finding that sweet spot, we definitely have too much waste, but trying to find exactly where and which places to push on and to try to improve on is something that hopefully the three of us as economists can help direct um, society to find the places that we can make the biggest bang for the buck, if you will, in terms of addressing food waste and do the most good for the most people. Lydia, Vijay, Charlotte. Well, uh, it's a great question. I, I love the economist angle. I come from a different angle at that because I'm a nutrition, um, I'm trained as a nutritionist. And so um, it is, I also started with the, with the dining house, but the, in, in my case, when I first saw it, um, I'm a, I'm a Kenyan American, so I came in as an immigrant uh, to the U.S. And when I first when I took my kids to school, uh, my my first born, I I just I I was astonished by how much we were wasting food, and and kids did not get enough time to eat, and and um, in in that instant, the teachers would come when I volunteered in the classroom and be like, "Are you done? Are you done? Take your tray up, take your tray up." And and to me, that really has stuck with me. How um, there are many barriers to you know to this issue, but the waste was very significant, even in a in a, in a um, childcare or. In a school setting, so I, I just have stayed with this problem and, and try to work it from my own end, but also try to talk about it in communities So and in our programs. Thank you. Powerful story. Thank you, Lydia. So I'm a weed, a weed scientist by training, and I work a lot with herbicides and other pesticides that are required for increasing food production. But right now, even before a, a fluid ounce or a pound of active ingredient is commercialized, it takes $350 million to develop a new pesticide, whether it's a fungicide, nematicide, insecticide, or herbicide. So the cost of production has gone up quite a bit. So we can't just produce enough to feed the world, world population. So I think 
saving the food that we already produce by increasing food loss and waste efforts is one of the uh, main ways to go. So I look forward to the results from Dr. Ellison's and Dr. Rose projects and uh, look forward to building on those. Okay, Charlotte. Yes, I didn't want to skip over you. <laughs> yep. So um, I would just say that in my, so I'm also an economist and previously was um, an a research economist at Economic Research Service. And I looked at food security and federal nutrition program um, assistance participation. And I moved over to NIFA where I was able to manage the research programs related to agricultural economics. And I was actually first introduced to this topic from an academic standpoint because I was receiving some proposals within the economics markets and trade program um, regarding food loss and waste. And so since I've been here consistently every year, we've had proposals related to this. So it was exciting to see this new program and also add some more language into the RFA in order to help um, continue to fund this research. Just so many unique avenues and paths. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it does look like we are at time. Um, so lots of great questions. Just again, I, please join me. Please join me, everyone, in thanking um, our panelists, our grantees. We're so excited about this work. Um, you all are making um, you know, this work, these programs a success. We can't do this without you. So again, just a reminder, uh, the recording, the slides are all going to be available on our NIFA Food and Nutrition Security webinar series webpage. In a few weeks, we just need to get those through our ADA compliance reviews of our transcripts. So again, thank you all for attending, and we look forward to seeing you at future webinar editions um, that we have posted in the chat. So have a great rest of the week, and goodbye. Thank you again.